have forfeited an opportunity to consecrate my name, you have created, in fact, a suitable Hashem. It seems rather perplexing that the Makos, the plagues, and in fact the splitting of the Red Sea, miracles in reference to which the Torah tells us by a of the Hashem of Moshe Abdo, that they indeed created trust both in the Rebona Shalom and in Moshe Rabbeinu. These were indeed performed by the Stam. So why is it that Moshe Rabbeinu was subsequently told that the very use of the staff is something which constitutes a need to cover Hashem, minimizing of the glory of the miracle of the Lubavitch. All of us know that the real partitioning of the parshas in the Torah is not the chapters. Chapters constitute a non-Jewish approach. We have Sukhos and Stumos. This particular Tanakh that I have here, although it does indicate where new chapters begin, will never allow the shape of the page to be altered by chapters. And the sense of continuity is determined by the Masara, the Psuchos, and the Stumos. Twice we find the puzzling phenomena in the Parsha that Moshe Rabbeinu says to the Almighty, I'm encumbered by a speech defect, so how will Paro listen to me? The Almighty responds to Moshe Rabbeinu. The puzzling thing is that the Almighty's response to Moshe, assuring him that Aaron will take care of things, starts a new parsha psucha after this one. In other words, imagine you would be reading in a novel, and chapter 13 comes to an end with, Good morning, sir, how are you? And then chapter 14 would begin with, Fine, thank you. Somebody would think that the sense of continuity was somehow not the smoothest. Yet this is precisely what we have here. Why this particular division? Also, we should address ourselves to the question, of which matos were performed by whom? What is it that the first three were done by Aaron and then, and only then, were they done by Moshe? No. The division is really not into two, but into three. We know that the bison which say, Pesach night, Lord Yehuda, Lord Yehuda, Lord Yehuda, Lord Yehuda, the Achav. Lord Yehuda would divide the matos into three different categories. The, the accepted explanation of the division of the Makos into these categories is this. The Tzach, the first three plagues are performed by Aaron with the staff. The next three, Adash, are performed by Moshe without the use of the staff. The last set, the Achal, are performed by Moshe with the staff. So, besides the question of why Moshe only after the first three. We should also wonder why it is that we originally find the staff in the hands of our the staff subsequently disappears for the middle set and it reappears only at the end in the hands of Moshe Rabbeinu. What's the meaning of that? Another interesting point here is that when the Torah tells us about Moshe and Aaron being sent to Paro, it says, by that Hashem of Moshe, by Aaron, by Yitzhak, El B'nai Yisrael. The Bodeshul spoke to Moses and Aaron. Subsequently, when the Parsha recapitulates what had happened, the Parsha says, Who Aaron, who Moshe, Hashem, Amar, Hashem, Lahem, Hotzi, was B'nai Yisrael, by Eretz and Yitzrael. These are the same Aaron and Moshe. For some reason, in recapitulating, it puts 
Aharon in front of Moshe, whereas when it initially stated that they were being sent, it said Moshe first and afterwards Aharon. Because it's important. Hmm? Important. That's true. That's a Rosh Chazal. Excellent. That the reason is that sometimes it says Moshe first and sometimes Aaron first. And this way, it lets us know that the two were equal. Nonetheless, we might wonder why it is that the one, why in this particular case, Moshe is first, and in that one, Aaron is first. That was in spite of the fact that Chazal are telling us that the reason sometimes Moshe first, sometimes Aaron first, but it's not both equal. Nonetheless, it is certainly not totally indiscriminately that we decide which one should have Aaron first and which one should have Moshe first.
because until now, all relationships between brothers in the Torah were competitive and antagonistic. Until now, we had one set of brothers, Chayim the heaven. There was another set of brothers, Yishmael and Yitzchak. We then learned about Yaakov and Esau. Then, the Yosef and his brothers. This is the way simple relationships have been since the very beginning of the time. At least competitive, sometimes antagonistic, and once even murderous. Now it tells us that the Siddur of Kahala is a turning point in history. Baracha of Asanach Balibo, Aaron was going to see that the younger brother Moshe was chosen for this prominence, and he's going to be thrilled to see it. Hold on, hold on to that thing, take less than two years. What does it mean when you say someone thing is an agent? What is a medium? What is an ideal medium? If somebody can tell me all of the events that occurred in Gaza last week, and after he transmits all of that information to you, you're left with absolutely no idea in the world of whether he favors Yossi Sarid's approach to these areas or Ariel Sharon's approach, then you can be certain you have a real medium. Somebody that can reduce himself to simply being the transmission between that which has occurred and the one learning about it. This is an ideal medium. The Tana tells us in reference to Adol Gazar was certainly as a medium, Pantisa Enecha Shamayim of Renisa's Kult Shamayim lest you look heavenward and see the beauty and prominence of the celestial bodies and decide to serve God through them. Why is this a bodhazar if you serve God through them? Very simple. When you say that you should go serve God through something because that something is prominent or beautiful, inherent in that line of reasoning is, that thing is somehow God-like, God-similar, or God-worthy. Serve God through it because it is great is attributing godliness to that thing. That's the paganism of it. Aru HaKon, on the other hand, was not chosen to be a medium because of what he was. He was chosen to be a Kohen because of his ability to be absolutely nothing. Because Aaron has the ability to so totally negate his subjective predicament, to the extent that Moshe Rabbeinu's good fortune comes smiling through his face, it is for that reason that he was chosen for Kahuna. The Dehem Alehem, Kahuna Sam Alehem. A Kohen can perform the service in the Mikdash only if he's in a uniform. And anybody who has ever put on a uniform knows that both externally and how it affects the wearer is a sense that one has been denied his individuality and by donning that uniform has been reduced to being a functionary, the tool of an objective. This is what the Kohen is. They have alayhem, who lost some alayhem. As long as they are in uniforms, robbing them of their own individuality and proclaiming them to be simply functionaries, then and only then can they function as Kohanim. The Kohen, this is the Ein the Gehenim, the Ganeidna, the Chutasar, the Boulevard between the Avod the Zorah and the Kohen. That which you choose to serve God through as a medium because of its prominence, you are attributing divine attributes to it. The Kohen is dafka because of his capacity to totally negate his subjective predicament. For that reason is he chosen. He goes into the base Hamikdash, the base Kotche Kadashim, and regardless of how saintly his own personal life is, he is the embodiment of the contrition of those who have committed the very foulest of deeds. This is Kahuna. This is why evident why Chazal see this as the highest of highs, as the most sacred of all sacreds. Now, if we say that our own's chosenness is on the basis of the selflessness, this ability to totally negate a subjective predicament, one might well ask, well, what then is the difference between our own and Moshe? Isn't that what Moshe was chosen for? Wasn't it the Shuta Shamikwa that told us that Moshe was chosen because he was the humblest of men, selfless receptacle, faithful transmitter, the whole base in What is the difference between these two, Moshe and Aaron? Did 
difference between them is day and night. They were both chosen because of their capacity for selflessness. There's an enormous difference between the two. Moshe's is a selflessness whose objective is the achievement of objectivity. Aaron's for the achievement of a different subjectivity. Let's take a look at this. We know that the very authenticity of the Torah is based on the fact that it was given to us by an honor. What does that mean? If he is not, it means he can transmit information totally unembellished. He can let us know the Devar Hashem without embellishing the Devar Hashem with his own intellectual inclinations and his intellectual predilections and his own preconceived notions. None of these are there. The purity of Teresh and Sam is based on the fact that it is given to us by he who has this remarkable gift for selflessness. All of us know the Medrash, which tells us about how Rabakiva was seen by Moshe Rabbein. He looked at Rabakiva giving a shield and he said to the Rabbein, you have such a gifted, brilliant, and articulate spokesman of Torah. What do you choose me for? Take the Neshama of Rabbi Kiva. That should have been the one chosen to give Torah. And the Rabbi Neshama of Rabbi Kiva said, Shalom. He said, be quiet. That is the point. Okay. You're dealing with the Torah Shiva Alper. Rabbi Kiva's intellectual initiative, his incisive mind, his gift for conceptualization. <laughs> All of these are crucial. But in the transmission of Torah Shedrasad, the crucial gift is shtok, the ability to not initiate one's own ideas, not to express one's self, not to give any expression whatsoever to one's own preconceived notions, a whole base cinema. This is what Moshe Rabbeinu is. All of me call Adam the whole base cinema, selfless, receptacle, faithful transmitter. I will have calling. This selflessness is for a very different reason. Not to be, not to order to enable any objectivity. We don't want our to be objective. Because I will have is an ambassador. Nobody wants an ambassador to be objective. We don't send an ambassador to the United Nations in order to give a dispassionate lecture about political trends in the Middle East. That's not what we expect of an ambassador. We want that an ambassador, regardless of how active and successful and bubbling with his own social life may be, we want that when he walks into the Security Council, after two of his nationals were killed, we want him to walk into the Security Council as the embodiment of the bleeding of that entire nation. It is not the function of an ambassador to be objective. The gift of an ambassador is the capacity to rid himself of his own subjective predicament and in its stead adopt the subjective predicament of those whom he represents. He is not there to be objective. That is not the function of an ambassador. The gift of an ambassador is to be subjective, but not, of course, to represent his own subjective predicament. That's why Aharon HaKohen was chosen. Not because of the fact that he met, he didn't meet Moshe Rabbeinu and say, Moshe, this is a fascinating appointment you've received. No, that he didn't view it objectively at all. Good fortune, smile from his face. That is what is called a genuine ambassador. So that we have over here two very, very different types of selflessness. That of Moshe Rabbeinu, the Anam Bikol Anam Bukhal Baisi Nama, which allows him to achieve total objectivity. And on the other hand, we have this Aaron Kohen who has this capacity to adopt the subjective predicament of others. And this was an historic step. Now, if you take a look at the difference between Moshe and Aaron, you will see the difference really is the difference between Tarashim Bukhsa and Tarashim Bukhsa. Moshe Rabbeinu is Torah Shemichsad, Imra Sashem Tzrufa, the pristine, unembellished word of the Rebbeinu Shalom, faithfully transmitted. This is Moshe. Aaron, on the other hand, is Torah Shemichsad, 
the way the divine word takes its form in the human consciousness. This is what Aaron Cohen represents. Now, throughout Jewish history, wherever Jews have ever been, the Asher Hain Shon, Jews have always distinguished themselves as intellectual hyper achievers. The reason for this is very simple. The Jews are the only people who say thrice daily, they issue a disclaimer. They say, it is you, God, who graces man with wisdom and teaches him to understand his unique prayer. Who was the first Jew to say, The first Jew whose intellectual achievements achieved recognition was the first one to issue the disclaimer. When Paro was impressed with Yosef HaTzadik, what did he say? He lay like Kim Kisraelis. Another time Paro complimented him, Yosef HaTzadik shot back, Biladai, Elaikim Yanesh Shlaim Paro, the first Jew to be recognized as a gifted intellectual, was also the first one to issue the disclaimer and say, It is you, the Almighty, and only you who can grace man with wisdom and teach him to understand. So effective was Yosef Hatzadik in driving this point home to Paro that subsequently, when Yosef presented Paro with his comprehensive program of economic reform, Paro said, what? This time he didn't say, look what a brilliant youngster we've got here. He said, look, has any other man been so graced with the wisdom of the Almighty? So that the first time the Egyptians learned about the existence of the Almighty, it was in his capacity as a chone la'adam da'as malamin the one who introduced monotheism to Egypt did so by pointing to the Almighty as the source of human wisdom. Now, Paro issued two denials. First of all, Paro said, he's a low yonas yonsegi. He didn't hear about this story about a human being whose wisdom is graced by God. And subsequently went even further and he said, Nihasha, he said, who altogether is there such a thing? you'll take a look at the first three macros, the first three plays, you'll see that the first three plays are nothing but a rematch between Yosef and Hakim and his life. It's exactly what takes place in the first three macros. How was it that Yosef initially introduced the existence of the Almighty to Paro? He showed them the difference between the two men of Zerayim on the one hand, who were unable to understand Paro's dreams to cope with the situation, and the wisdom of the one who was graced by the Almighty. This is how Yosef Atzadik did it, right? We were from the start shown the competition of the two men of Zerayim, who showed themselves to be intellectually impotent, and then there was Yosef Atzadik whose force came through. If you look at the first three battles, you'll see the following. It is repeat with a vocabulary of self-assertion, and it is done with the matter. Who is the one that is chosen? If we are going to want to show a competition between human wisdom, whose source is in the Almighty, and human wisdom that does not have that as its source, the right one is, of course, who? Ah, the man of Tel Shabbat Peh. The one who shows the ability of the human consciousness to give form to the divine inspiration. The man of Taylor Shabbat Peh, Aaron comes, he says, He's for watch what I will do. Let me show you Taylor Shabbat Peh, Chachmas Yisrael, the wisdom of a Knesset Yisrael, which is inspired by the Ribbon Shalom. And that's why you have the first three Makos. This competition going on between Aaron and on the one hand and the Chaltume Mitzrayim on the other. And finally, after the first three Makos, they yield. After the first three Makos, 
They say that's the way him here, the cartoon they've been trying to say. At this point, we stop, we see that we lost this series, we decline from the competition. Again, it is Yesa Patsani, the one who says at the we other Das, it is he who is able to prevail over a wisdom which is purely human. No. So, the first three battles were performed by Aaron, the man of the Torah Shabbat Peh, and he's doing it really the matter, the symbolism of the matter is self-assertion, and that's his vocabulary too. His partner of life, watch what I will do, watch this, watch that. I will show you the Maya Chachma, is in the tradition of Yosef and Tzadik's Chachma. Moshe Rabbeinu was not chosen for his role as Moshe and Shal Yisrael, the one who would redeem Kalal Yisrael, and give them their Torah in spite of the fact that he was encumbered by a speech defect, that he was inarticulate, that he lacked the leadership presence that Aaron Akhoi apparently had. He was not chosen as Moshe and Shal Yisrael in spite of all of these, but rather because of them. It is because of the fact that Moshe Rabbeinu was inarticulate, encumbered by a speech defect, and lacking the leadership presence that Aaron had, it is for this reason that Moshe Rabbeinu was chosen. This way we are going to have a man who is going to do things that will not be associated with himself, but instead with the Almighty. His leadership will not be seen as the assertion of his own talents, his own initiative, his own drive, his own ego or aspirations. Whatever he does will be seen as his acting as nothing but a tool of the will of the Almighty. For this reason, this man lacking in the basic qualities of leadership is the one who was chosen. We know that crucial to leadership in this world is the capacity to articulate. In fact, one of the words for leader in Hebrew is a davar. No, if anybody has ever taken an officer's course, voice control, the capacity to project authority through the spoken word is crucial. The right man to lead the Jewish people and still assure that his leadership will not be associated with himself, the perfect man is who? Moshe Rabbeinu. No. When you present a dialogue in any book, whether it's fiction or non-fiction, the dialogue takes place on two separate and independent levels. First of all, the principals are talking to each other. Secondly, they are also talking to the reader. You present a narrative in writing and presenting a dialogue between two people, you write it down. You're writing on two separate levels at the same time. You have the principals talking to each other, and at the same time, they're talking to the reader. Moshe turns to the Rebbe Shalom and he says, Look how is Paro going to listen to me? I mean, I'm encumbered by a terrible speech defect. The parasha comes to an end. The conversation continues. In terms of what's being presented to the reader, that's the point. Moshe comes and says, How can you send me to Paro? Can't you see? I'm totally inarticulate and covered by a speech defect. The curtains come down. Because to the reader, that's the point. In terms of the conversation, the Rebbe comes back continues and just says to Moshe, fine Moshe, I'll send Aaron with you and then everything will be fine. But Moshe, he is the one who's chosen not to be because of his being in our That's the whole point that the Torah is emphasizing. No. Incidentally, the answer to what we brought up before him why it is that in rep, when it says that Moshe spoke, it puts Moshe first, and why, when it sums up, there haven't been spoken to, it puts Aaron first, that too, too has been answered. Why? When we're talking about the fact of the Rebbe Shalom's transmitting his word to us, so the 
pristine word. It's transmission. Shechina medaberes mitel grona. It's Vayomer Hashem El Moshe Ve'El Aaron. It is Moshe who is crucial in the transmission. But when you're going to talk about the fact that they had been spoken to, and that the word had been transmitted, and then took its form in the human consciousness, then to Aaron and Moshe, Hashem Ve'Hashem In terms of having been spoken to, it is Aaron who takes presence to Moshe. But in any case, let's go back to the inarticulate motion covered by a speech defect, lacking in the leadership presence that Aaron has. Now, he steps forward for the next three makos. Why? What are the next three makos? Adash introduces a new dimension. Aaron Debrashkin, we have the element of the hit law. Makos, which will be applied so totally discriminatorily as to leave no mistaken impressions about what the source of the makos is. Now, with Adash, the second three, as with the first three, we are still dealing with relatively natural phenomena, but now they're going to be applied so utterly discriminatorily as to make it clear that they're being administered by the divine providence itself. Well, now that we want makos not to resettle again that issue between Yosef and Khartoum and its right, but now we want Matos directed at the second denial of Para, Mi Hashem 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 Now, you have to take out that person, so lacking the leadership presence and articulacy, that will assure that whatever he does will not be associated with himself. He's not going to hold that Mata, which is now associated with Assertiveness. That was the point of Aaron's having it. Now we have that person who will be able to act, and we're going to now have the man of the lesser stature performing the far greater miracles. So he does the Adash, the order of Dever Shrim. But after Adash, which were directed, refuting Paro's denial of so, here too, it didn't work. But now something else has happened. Now Moshe has been clearly identified as the man of lesser stature, personal stature, who nonetheless performs the far greater miracles. From now on, Moshe will be associated with the act of God so directly that it will simply be seen as a selfless tool, and therefore in the last Matos from then and on, the matzah will be in his hand, and anything which he will perform will be indeed associated with the divine providence, not with himself. What he does is never going to be considered self-assertion. He apparently seems to like the self. Now, the next matzah after the adash is Barba. Barba is described as kol magei Why is it kol magei Because now, for the first time, dialogue between divine providence and power's free will is brought to an end. It had been momentarily suspended beforehand that now Bara is his last opportunity at free will. Bara will be power's last chance. With Bara he will have the first defiance of natural law. Eish is lakakas Bara. Fire and ice intertwined falling from the sky. And it is for this reason that it is called Kol Magnei and is described with a few other superlatives. Does everybody know? Borod swayed him, Paro, but only momentarily. For that reason, after Borod, once Borod was over, we were then told that the entire purpose of Matos then would just be Rebos Moksai the Eretz Mitzvah in order to strengthen the historic impact as much as possible. But as far as dialogue with Paro goes, it now comes to an end. At the very beginning, we posed the question of why it is that Moshe was punished for the use of the Mata. The Mata, after all, created tremendous Kiddush Hashem, described as by Amin and Hashem of Moshe Atta. So why is it that his use of the Mata 
in reference to the water coming out of the rock was considered to be something which played down the Almighty's role. But the answer is this. At the beginning of that parsha of Memory, it says, by Yobin, Yobin, Yisrael, Shalai. The entire B'nai Yisrael, okay. Rashi tells us, what does this mean, the entire B'nai Yisrael? Shetamun, Mason, Yisrael. There was no one left who had been in Egypt. What difference did that make? The people that had been in Egypt that saw the Makos saw that it was the lesser man, the apparently lesser man in terms of leadership presence, it was the lesser man who performed the greater miracles. The fact that the lesser man performed the greater miracles defined the staff in his hand as being nothing but a tool of the Almighty. The moment there were no longer people left who had witnessed this phenomenon of motion, so this staff reverts to its natural symbolism, which is self-assertion. And if it is self-assertion, then indeed it is considered to be a meat with something which played down the glory.